This session will approach the issue of public governance at the intersection of freedom of belief and gender. Our moderator is Zehra Yilmaz, Dr. Zehra Yilmaz. I would like to introduce her to you before giving the floor introduce her to you before giving the floor to her. Zehra Yilmaz is an associate professor of pol political science who graduated from Bashkent University, political science and international relations department. She finished her PhD at Ankara University, international relations department. She's recently working as a guest researcher at Leiden University Law School and lecturer at Baden Yüzyıl University, international relations department. She has published various articles and written book chapters. She has also done national and international research projects focusing on gender, Islam and migration. She has been conducting research on formal policies through everyday life practices of Muslim women in the Netherlands. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mine. This is our last session and it's called Public Governance at the Intersection of Freedom of Belief and Gender. We have three panelists. Today, the theme of our first speech will be related to freedom of belief, gender equality, and social services. Theoretical and contextual dimensions will be tackled by Figen Ural. These panelists will complement each other, actually. The second speech will be related to representation. Who is rep represented in the public sector? Who is allowed to uh, represent others there? And our last speech will tackle women, women's place in mosques, which are part of public space. First of all, I would like to remind you that you have 20 minutes each please respect your time limit. I will make some contributions to your presentations and then I will ask each of you questions. But I do not want to answer these questions right away. We are going to have a Q&A session in the end. So please answer my questions first and then we can elaborate on them and we can give our participants some time to think about their own questions. So we are going to start with Figen Ural. Figen Ural will talk to us about freedom of belief and social services in the context of human rights and gender equality. Let me introduce her to you. She received her BA from the Social Services Department of Hacettepe University and her MA from the Management of Social Services Department at Uşak University with her thesis titled Evaluating Patients with Bipolar Disorder and Psychosis from a Social Services Perspective. She's a PhD student in the field of Children and Family Studies at Dokuzeyl University. She has also been working as a social worker since 2017. The floor is yours. Interpreters cannot hear the speaker. We cannot hear you. Figen Hanım, sesiniz kapalı. Açabilir misiniz? You are on mute, Figen. Can you please, can you please unmute yourself? Sesinizi aşağıdan açar mısınız? Duyabiliyor musunuz bizi? Can you hear us? Tamam, sesiniz kapalı görünüyordu ama açabilir misiniz? You were on mute. Please unmute yourself. Can I step in here? Figen Hanım, you will see an arrow, upward arrow icon next to you, your name. Uh, there you will see the headphone option. So please choose the correct headphones. Okay. I will just change my headphones to avoid this technical problem. Hello again. Thank you very much for your introduction. I prepared a presentation for you uh, in relation with my theme. First of all, in the context of human rights, 
I would like to talk about the theory and content of freedom of belief. Since a human being is a biological and a social creature, they need to live together. They need to build societies. They need to play certain roles and assume certain responsibilities. And these roles and responsibilities change depending on gender. This brings along the principle that humans should be equal. Human rights are universal. They express values related to human beings. At this moment, social services, the profession, fulfills some implementations related to human rights. They also increase human development capacity and protect people's rights and honors. It also encourages equality of opportunity. It also encourages an egalitarian society. It also tries to prevent right violation, uh, rights violations, combats against social injustices. It adopts multidisciplinary approaches in order to work on all of these issues and it works for freedom of belief in this context in this context context i would like to start with the definition of human rights human civilization has some basic rights uh, these rights include freedom of expression freedom of religion and conscience and all human beings must equally benefit from these rights and they have freedom of belief without uh, regardless of their color of their sex of their race they all have the same status the concept of human rights came to the agenda in the beginning of 1800s and in our country, there were certain legislation arrangements, uh, legislation changes in our country when our process of membership to the EU started. Uh, this started uh, this started the developments in this field in 1926 when the civil law was adopted. A new era started for women's rights, discrimination against women and the related problems were started to be tackled and these issues are important in terms of women's rights and human rights in terms of gender equality women have the first generation rights such as their personal and political rights but also their their second generation rights uh, which includes their economic social and cultural cultural rights. So equality and discrimination must be eliminated from all fields of social life. And this is all part of uh, the broad term of women's rights. When we look at the concept of gender equality, it actually means the fulfillment of roles and responsibilities that fall under uh, their gender so the perception about gender brings about certain discrimination based on gender uh, and this all affects uh, gender's perceived roles and responsibilities therefore the concept of freedom of belief is also affected from the perception of gender. When we say freedom of belief, we also mean a part of first generation rights. This also facilitates the use of other rights, such as right to free trial, right to live, right to freedom. 
this also serves as an advocate for first generation rights for basic rights also this supports other types of rights such as freedom of uh, speech everyone is free to uh, be oriented towards different beliefs when people choose a certain belief uh, they should be respected and they should uh, be able to exist in a society with their beliefs when we take a look at social service implementations first of all we need to define what social service work is their primary target is people with disabilities elderly uh, the sick and individuals who are exposed to violence also families with communication problems and similar individuals and it proposes certain intervention plans so if individuals suffer from right violations they should also be evaluated under the scope of social services and they should serve for the protection of the rights and honor of human beings people must be aware of their rights they should be informed about their rights and if necessary uh, advocacy activities should be carried out under the scope of social services therefore social services and human rights cannot be uh, tackled separately they are integrated concepts therefore different types of social services should be provided for disadvantaged and vulnerable groups such as physical services or moral services emotional support services there are some intersection uh, intersections under this within the scope of feminism there is also the issue of freedom of speech of women this also falls under the category of uh, responsibilities of social services tolerance respect adoption of these concepts by the society are all practices that should be encouraged by social services as a conclusion human beings have been faced with many injustices in the history and they are affected by the fast changing social structure so within this concept uh, within this context the perception of gender is changed by the perception of uh, gender's roles and responsibilities and they are sometimes Uh, they, they are sometimes affected by these common uh, prejudices to advance human rights gender equality must be ensured and uh, social the concept of social justice should be strengthened therefore a strong relation should be established between human rights and social uh, services and these efforts are important in terms of removing in terms of removing social injustices increasing uh, cases of violence show us that human rights violations are still ongoing uh, uh, in our society taking steps in order to ensure equality in the society is very important because this is not only a problem of women this is a problem of the entire society and social services must approach the issue in this way if we take a look at the issue from the perspective of freedom of belief we are faced with many cases of people who are discriminated against uh, because of their gender 
since social services advocate rights and freedoms, they should expand their intervention plans uh, in a way that would help this issue. The discipline of social services advocates for uh, against all uh, types of rights, rights violations. They also tackle the issue of discrimination because of uh, gender and because of belief. Therefore, services must be conducted in a way that takes into consideration all of these. This is what's expected of social services. In my opinion, this is going to help better conduct social services. Thank you very much. I believe you are done, Figan. Yes, I try to be as brief as possible. I try to make an efficient use of my time. I wanted to mention some important definitions. I hope that I didn't exceed my time limit. No, not at all, but no problem. You're going to have more time in the discussion part uh, so you can complete. Uh, if there are any missing points, maybe you can integrate my questions to the remaining part of your presentation and uh, you can uh, make a more efficient time of uh, use of your time. Thank you very much for this informative presentation. I would like to ask you some questions in order to make more concrete certain points that you mentioned, especially uh, in the specific context of Turkey. In Turkey, there are two dimensions of social services. The first one is that social services are handed over to foundations and associations. They are uh, in the field of civil society, if you will. And the state's role of social services is related to family policies, social services, and the intersection of religion and presidency of religious, uh, religious affairs. When I mentioned civil society before, I meant more religious organizations. Therefore, if we look at Turkey from this perspective, how do you evaluate the situation in the specific context of Turkey? How do you interpret this intersection? So this will be my question to you in the second part of our panel in the Q&A session. In the discussion part, you can uh, answer this question. So uh, this will be my question to you. Now I would like to move on with the second pan with our second panelist. The second speech will be delivered by two people: Shehid Zehra Kileş Yüksel and Zelal Yalçın. Let me introduce. Jade Zehra Kelesh Yüksel to you. By the way, their team is receiving services from the other in the public service, encountering women, inclusion, and cultural competence. Jade Zehra Kelesh Yüksel got her bachelor's degree from the sociology and psychology departments at Marmara University and her master's degree in the field of social policies at Bosphorus University. She actively participated in many different organizations such as Havla Women's Association, Muslim Dar, Women in Mosques Platform, and Muslims Against Violence Against Women Initiative. For the past two years, she has been working at the Istanbul Planning Agency of Istanbul Metropolitan, Metropolitan Municipality as an expert on social policies, gender policies, and poverty. Zelal Yalçın uh, will be the second person delivering this presentation. After graduating from the Statistics Department of Mimar Sinan University, she received her master's degree from the Public Administration Department in Istanbul University. She served various functions at Morçeti, the Conference on Fictions and Truth, and the teams of 2010 Sedaw Shadow Report CSO. She is one of the founders of the Association of Local Watch Research and Applications. She worked as an expert on gender equality in the Gender Equality Division of Shishli District Municipality for many years. She currently works as a social policy coordinator at the Istanbul Planning Agency of Istanbul Metropolitan Municipality. Our panelists are both academics and they have uh, experiences in the field. So how are you going to organize this? Uh, are you both going to take the floor? 
dakikanız var. Tamam. Right then you have 20 minutes. First of all, I'm going to shut down WhatsApp so that you're not going to be hearing that. So this is a sort of a brainstorming exercise, as a matter of fact, rather than a standard presentation. And we're going to talk about how corruption uh, as corruption is going on uh, very fast and even we were talking about whether Alevi pre whether an Alevi president would be possible in Turkey or not so what we're going to be speaking about is especially when we talk about the social inclusiveness public uh, recruitment public employment what does it mean for people and finding ourselves there or not being able to find out ourselves there, what does that tell in, in terms of our citizenship? And also what kind of an impact does that have on the quality of service that we have? We are a very difficult uh, society. We have to, first of all, say that because people have op been oppressed in the past, for example, there have been people who have always been poor, who have been systematically uh, persecuted and who have not been able to part of public employment because of their characteristics. Therefore, we would like to uh, address whether an inclusive public recruitment policy could help us mend those problems, heal those problems. So first of all, how do the public employees affect our lives? Who is becoming a traffic policeman, for example, land registry officer, etc in public employment first of all we need to ask that who is the decision maker and what kind of decisions they take so first of all we have high level managements like bureaucrats for example they take very important uh, decisions about our lives and it's very important who they're including and who they're excluding but also what is really important is that a decision maker doesn't really isn't really that visible uh, for us in our lives we don't really see them that much in our daily lives. It's like they are not even there. But who do we see? We see the bureaucrats at the street level. So these are the um, uh, figures of um, uh, public works in our lives, like those people, for example, who ensure uh, welfare, who redistribute it, who uh, decide on the meritocracy, the merit criteria in order for you to get that uh, welfare and also people who ask you questions and sometimes even disturb you with your uh, with their questions. And all of that are political is political issues. Because although public services are very planned in order to reach certain uh, targets, the bureaucrats on the uh, uh, street level are very um, uh, suggestible or impactable. Therefore, the decisions that they take, the uncertainties that they might cause, the coping mechanisms that they adopt, their bargaining processes are the real public policies that we're faced with every day. Therefore, we believe that policy is recreated at the street level because of this. So think about an imam, for example, or a social worker, or a school principal, uh, civil registrant. These people have the authority to make decisions in their own jurisdiction. And these are sub-policies. And as a matter of fact, public policies are only becoming meaningful when you encounter sub-policies. So we have especially looked at this, uh, uh, looked at social work as part of the sub uh, policy. And in our country and also in Europe as well, for example, generally the good uh, doers or the Uh, philanthropists would act as social workers, for example, but then social work became more systematized. And since 1980s, 
we see that around many places in the world, the social work has been rediscovered in terms of what it can do in terms of faith and other issues. But could you slow down a little bit because simultaneous interpretation is going on at the moment? So this professionalization and standardization in social work and also secularization means that the policies and the services are being implemented on a rights basis at the moment, but that also made the color of the public sector more grayer, in my opinion. So Hannah Arendt, if we could define the public sector with one word, that could be pluralism, she says. So it is a joint area where each voice should be voiced. Uh, uh, pluralism does not also uh, convert it into a medley of mixed voices. And this, uh, uh, there could be distances between these voices, obviously. Uh, However, the professionalization of social work, the churches and congregations role in the welfare distribution being liquidified in a way, I think it's a very important uh, opportunity. Uh, however, for countries like Turkey, where you don't really have a pluralist, uh, pluralist public pol uh, uh, policies, that meant that the public side has become a single side to some uh, aspect that means that in the public employees we generally see the exclusion of different uh, identities and we believe that this as a matter of fact erodes the social fabric that means that if it goes on like this then that is going to have immense impacts in terms of the dissolution of the society so what does that mean first of all reaching the necessary services and also feeling a sense of belonging and who do we mean here especially those people who can't really feel that they are represented in public employment and also those people who only see themselves as a matter of fact and also those people who because of their ethnic uh, identities or religion or opinions can only be in the public employment as a marginal there as marginalized figures there so while implementing some policies at the street level, sometimes those policy makers also cause a lot of difficulty as well. I'm just going to give you an example from the US. So Afro-American social workers, for example, feel that they see a hidden racism in the service uh, delivery. And sometimes they say that they feel under threat because of that. So in some of the research for, about that, for example, an at-home health personnel is responsible for providing healthcare services and he, uh, an Afro-American such health personnel says that even if I go to a white person's house, for example, to provide them with healthcare services, I feel that I uh, uh, feel under threat because of their gaze. So imagine this situation in Turkey, for example, who would be the person that would feel under threat, who would be the landlord. So that kind of, these kinds of issues are caused by the creeks that we already have in society. And also in terms of mending those creeks, I believe that we need to defend and advocate for a pluralist public policy, because that really creates a sort of a social mending mortar. And also it uh, supports uh, access to health, uh, access to uh, services, and also um, uh, provides a peaceful employment environment as well. Obviously, I, I, because of that we are against the society what, uh, that is single-sided uh, uh, when there is a pluralist public policy, you would make it possible for different identities to come together to encounter one another, and that is especially should that especially should be provided at this street level. So, 
exclusionary policies, for example, keeping veiled women out of public employment and also keeping other subjects that have been systematically marginalized in public employment. Those kinds of issues have to be uh, understood better. Uh, persons with disabilities, uh, Kurdish people, um, other minorities and also uh, people who have been excluded from public employment because of their sexual orientation or gender identity. That is, uh, uh, that gap is important and should be filled in. And because of the economic devastation that the pandemic brought and because of the deepening poverty, we have spoken to women who have applied for social assistance and there was a household visitor from different public institutions that visited them because of this application. So each of them, as a matter of fact, had an encounter with a bureaucrat at the street level and all of these been identified as pious and they said that they are happier to see social workers or social assistance personnel that are more like them in a way however sometimes we have also found situations for example that the veiled women did not really believe that getting getting services from another veiled woman did really mean that they were getting quality services. So we see that there could be a multiplicity of views there. So, I am mostly curious about how people and how entities organize themselves in a capitalist uh, order and i remember an ad about such uh, such and uh, such companies but i couldn't really find that ad i'm just going to tell you what that ad was so, in the Far East, a company is trying to find a place in the market, and there is an English firm. And in a business dinner, representatives from that firm come together with high-level managers in that market. And in that dinner, they have an eel before us, an eel soup because of the cuisine they don't they're not really sort of accustomed to that accustomed to eating eel but so that they're going to see that he means business he eats that soup and also gets the bread in front of him and also immerses that into the soup as well and when he does that the Far East business people ask for a second serving of the eel soup in a bigger cup, in a bigger plate. And again, the English businessman eats that so that is going to be deemed sincere. And also his face, you know, looks like he doesn't want another one to come, but he uses his bread again in the soup so once he does that the asian businessmen bring on a python snake soup and then the english businessman basically faints and shows how icebreakers are important for businesses to be established between different cultures and that was an ad of an icebreaker firm as a matter of fact that would be uh, that would make it easier for you to invest in far east for example because the english businessman doesn't know that they should not uh, 
uh, they, uh, in the English business plan believes that they need to completely eat their meals because otherwise it would be disrespectful in the Western culture for your hosts. But in the Asian culture, if you finish it up, then that means that the food was not enough. So although they're speaking English around the same table, these are two groups of people who couldn't really understand one another, but are still trying to cooperate. So, this is how in communication, non-communication or a failure of communication can come up. So the ad talked about that. I just wanted to mention this because companies for profit need to have those cultural capabilities and need to have those ice uh, breaking uh, capacity and that it was about that as i said but when you look at the public side that has to be also improved and that is what we've seen in our own research as well as zehra mentioned this inclusivity relationship can only be created through a cultural acclimatization and cultural flow in order for women to actively benefit from public services both the service delivery personnel and also the decision makers have to have many more women among themselves and also inclusivity and creating egalitarian services is again a very important point but on their own that is not enough and should not be regarded as enough should not be regarded as sufficient and that is why we try to come up with this framework in one in a in a society If the services are created in a pluralist manner, in if everybody can see themselves uh, in the uh, services, that would be highly important. And also, especially for the marginalized people, it should be uh, told uh, that, uh, and it should be shown to them that the public sector is not against them, but for, for them in order to have a sustainable community sustainable society this is a guarantee that we need to assure and this is also a social mortar in a way also the service relationship is an asymmetric one we should remember that as well that is why service providers and public institutions have an autonomous area and in which they need to democratize the inclusion of the others as well. Another important point is that the public service relationship is also an interaction area, interactive area, especially in polarized societies. In pluralist service delivery, if you encounter people like yourselves in the service uh, delivery, then that can create a very bonding uh, feeling. For example, in the interviews conducted, some of the veiled women were very happy that there were more veiled women in the public employment and also we're very happy to see that some of the personnel were now speaking uh, Kurdish or Arabic or their own language. Therefore, when women start to encounter each other more through service delivery, we see that the walls between them are demolished more and more. And also, just ensuring pluralism does not mean inclusivity in public employment, we believe that 
a categorized public employment system would be a better idea rather than a fragmented one. So regardless of their identity based on their social capabilities, people from all different walks of life and identities should be employed. Therefore, the social workers should be supported and supervised along that vein. And we see that need on the ground as well. So especially for women and also for other groups of people who have difficulty in accessing these services, sometimes have to get support from informal areas because of this. And that is something that we've encountered on the ground as well. Lastly, pluralist employed in the public sector, because that is not institutionalized at the moment, that means that some groups dominate the employment area and pass it out between themselves. And that kind of a favoritism has been seen in Turkey and we have suffered from it. So because of the fact that we have also experienced that kind of thing, that uh, uh, the, the inclusivity policy has to be implemented in public employment in Turkey, we believe. Thank you. Uh, Thank you for your respecting your time limit as well. This was a very good presentation, very informative. You both tackled the theoretical part and you mentioned the field. When I read your text, I thought about some questions related to your methodology. Maybe we could give you some time later so that you can explain your methodology more. For example, how many people did you reach out? What kind of an interview method did you follow? So, I will ask you to give us some information on, on that. Did you choose a certain location? Did you compare data related to uh, locations? I am going to ask you to elaborate on all of, all of these later. And you used the term cultural competence in your theme. Belonging to a certain culture, does it bring about that cultural acceptance, as, uh, that cultural competence as well. So please think about that question as well. Thank you very much once again. If you'll allow me, I'm going to move on with our third panelist. Our third panelist is Humeira Dinchar. Her theme is negotiating gender, gendered speciality, women preachers in the mosque. Actually, she is also going to address the issue of women in mosques. Uh, in the previous presentation, Burcu had talked about this, and I believe Meira's presentation will be complementary to that one. Let me introduce her to you. She completed her master dissertation in 2019 on the sermons of the women preachers of the Presidency of Religious Affairs in mosques at the Department of Sociology in Bosphorus University. She still pursues her PhD studies in the Department of Sociology in Ibn Khaldun University. Her PhD studies include concepts of backsliding, deism, atheism. She also took part in various projects as a researcher. Humira, the floor is yours. You have 20 minutes. Thank you very much. Can you hear me well? Yes, we can hear you well for now. Okay, I am going to follow up on the issue of public mentioned by Shehide and Zelal. I am also going to uh, add on what Pigan had said on uh, women and gender. This speech will be based on my dissertation, my PhD dissertation. This is related to the uh, women preachers in Üsküdar assigned by the Presidency of Religious Affairs, uh, Affairs, I went to the field, I listened to these women preachers' sermons, and I interviewed them. In Üsküdar only, 
there are 190 mosques and 24 of these mosques have women preachers. Uh, there were six women preachers back at the time when I carried out this field study. So I followed five of them. One of them was on maternity leave. So there were five of them that I followed. I visited mosques with them. I listened to their sermons. And as a result, I had some idea about their context of uh, sermons. And I asked them what they thought about these sermons. And I wrote my thesis based on their answers. Today, I will be focusing on the mosques. There is a connection problem on the side of the speaker. This is the interpreter's note. I got curious about this issue. I wanted to listen to their sermon. I went to the mosque. The prayers were done. And then women, pre uh, the woman who was a preacher arrived. So the women, uh, the woman took the place of the imam. Uh, she got on the rostrum. She put on her microphone and uh, women gathered around her. So I went uh, to stand with them. But this was quite a change for me because mosques are places where women have to hide from when they enter into mosques. So women giving sermons in mosques were quite a, it was quite a change for me, putting on a microphone, all the women there, uh, while at the same time men entering and getting out of the mosque. This was quite interesting to me. This is why I wanted to focus on the issue of mosques in today's presentation. Muslim women and women preachers are a concept with which we're familiar, but uh, witnessing this in a mosque was interesting for me. When we discuss the issue of women in Islam, what we say is that we refer to the era of the Prophet and the situation of women, the status of women is discussed. When we take a look at Quran, the Holy Book of Quran, we don't say that uh, there is not a judgment about women participating in mosques. There is no limitation about their participant participation and there is no uh, provision that say they can either. There is not much reference to it. So what we see here is that in the era of the prophet, uh, yes, women participated in prayers. They went to the masjid of the uh, prophet. It's not a mosque. It's like a training center as well. They talk about daily issues. They decide on daily issues there. There are uh, passages in the Quran about this that confirm this. And the presence of the religious affairs, of religious affairs, taking this as a basis, they brought this issue to the agenda. In 2010, they uh, repaired the physical conditions of mosques and they ameliorate uh, to the um, women's places as well. They tried to open up some space for women in mosques and they gave reference to the Quran. For example, there is a passage that says, do not deprive women who are God's subjects from mosques. This passage shows us that women are encouraged to go to mosques, but there's an anthropologist cost who works on this issue. And he says that this passage shows us that even in early years, there was a resistance against women going to mosques. 
when we think about relationship between women and mosques, we should also think about this resistance and this intolerance against women going to mosques. I believe this is important because this was not monotype throughout the history. In different points of time, different practices were observed. This is not only related to the relationship between women and mass, uh, women and mosques. Uh, women position in social life has changed a lot as well. And mosques position in social life has changed a lot as well. Before social life was shaped around mosques, it was a social and cultural uh, space um, and a place to socialize. At the moment, this is not the same thing. Uh, social and cultural activities are carried out by different organizations and uh, mosques are a place of worship merely. But the presence of religious affairs want to move mosques back into the center of lives. Therefore, they give importance to participation from everyone, uh, everyone going to mosques, not only men, but women and children as well. In the uh, first day, this issue was tackled, uh, bringing mosques back to the center of daily life. How about women's problems? What do they experience? Let me briefly talk about that. Yes, women have a right to access mosques. This is accepted by everyone. But in practice, there is a lot of dis discrimination going on. What is it? They are not wanted in mosques. And many mosques in parallel with this are not appropriate for women. Conditions are lacking. And male congregation, men who go to mosques, they do not tolerate them very well. We know that uh, places allocated to women have bad conditions, uh, basement floors, for example, enclosed areas, really enclosed or separate buildings, if possible. Uh, so cramped enclosed areas, physical conditions, really not sufficient. Ventilation or heat heating, generally not sufficient. We know that these spaces allocated to women uh, do not have good physical conditions. And this is not limited to physical conditions. There are also some mental barriers, which are even more important. Uh, they do not ban women from coming to mosques, but they uh, create a perception as if it's not necessary. They say women do not have to go to mosques. And this raises question marks in women's minds. One of the preachers said the following about this. She says, she depicts the situation very well, actually. When you go to a mosque, uh, do you ever feel like you're not wanted there by people who think they own the place? Yes, we feel that way whenever we go to a mosque. Not only those who go to mosques regularly, ordinary people feel like women should not be there. They treat women as if women have come to mosques to make them sin. So they do whatever they can to push you away, they say. This was a preacher who said that. So. This is related to power and authority, and men are very dominant there, so they do not want women. And this feeling of not being wanted uh, affects women very much, affects what they do in mosques uh, and how regularly they go to mosques. They internalize it so much that they do not want to be seen. They want to be rapid and get into the mosque, do their prayers, and then get out as soon as possible. This is how they behave as a result. Even women who believe that they have equal rights in mosques with men, they uh, pay a toll because of this male dominant atmosphere. I believe uh, they feel this as soon as they approach a mosque at the entrance, they show you where to go. And once you get inside, they show you where to sit, where to go. Another preacher had said that it's like mosques are, male, are a male country 
and women are refugees who are trying to get into the border. I think this is quite a good metaphor to understand the issue. So mosques are gendered in this way. And this gives men the right to intervene in women's uh, involvement. There was a typical example. Yesterday, this was mentioned, I believe. Uh, there is a platform, women in mosques platform, this formation in Fatih Mosque, uh, a couple of women were expelled from mosque. I mean, they were kicked out of the mosque from the vicinity of the mosque as well. Uh, there are many examples like this one, but this example shows us that when women uh, express their trouble because of this gendered uh, mentality, uh, they are kicked out right away. How about preachers? We talked about women's problems in general, but how about preachers? In my field study, I went to different uh, mosques with different preachers, and I was able to observe different methods uh, followed by these preachers. I can say that Uh, all of these preachers accept that women have equal rights with men in these mosques and they have complaints, but their way of uh, overcoming this, uh, coping with this is different. Preachers are aware that they're not welcome because they're women and they suffer from the same treatment as other women, but when they give sermons in mosques, they experience more because as preachers assigned by the presidents of religious affairs, their position is different from a ordinary citizen because they're assigned by the presidency of religious affairs. They are assigned to inform women on religious issues. So they have this authority. Their religious experience is recognized and accepted so they are in a way uh, leaders and they have more authority as compared to an ordinary uh, woman so this authority does it change their participation in mosques or does it challenge the gendered speciality of mosques i wanted to answer this question so these women even, uh, even though they are assigned by the presidency of religious affairs, they experience problems in uh, the mosques of the same presidency, and they have to come up with certain methods to overcome this, because mosques are also their workplace. They serve there, and they have to uh, they have to be uh, they, they they have to tackle the problems coming from different problems. For example, imams, uh, people who have cleaning duties in a mosque. Uh, there is a male congregation and some of them are regulars they go uh, to that mosque every day they own up uh, to the place actually they feel like they own the place so they have to these women have to negotiate with them all the time so when some men from the con congregation come along they remove all the women right away uh, also, women do not uh, go to mosques uh, that much, that regularly, and this is one of the reasons. Because sometimes people say that people rarely go to mosques, and this is why there's a discrimination there, but actually this is because of the gendered spatiality. And this is not an issue of numbers. Women are not wanted to such a degree that they do not only show you to your own place, uh, they 
can even ban you from going to that mosque. For example, one of my preachers said that she could not continue giving sermon, sermons in the mosque that she worked before, where she worked before, because there was a man there uh, whose duty was to open the door for her. And every time she went there, she had to reach out to this person. Uh, but uh, each and every time that person uh, was stalling, uh, he used to take some walks before uh, opening the door for them, for the women, because he just didn't want women in that mosque. I was really surprised. I said, how come uh, a woman assigned, a woman preacher assigned by the presidency of religious affairs cannot even be let in in a mosque? I uh, was really surprised, but this shows us that uh, men really, uh, I mean, women feel like they are not wanted. And this also raises some question marks about the control of the presidency of religious affairs. The imams, local people there, uh, they have so much uh, rights and power on that mosques that the uh, presidency of religious affairs cannot even intervene. Even though some places are under the responsibility of the presidency, the associations, the local associations, the local people there, uh, other institutions around, they can be more effective. And the presence of religious affairs has difficulties in intervening. So even when the presidency cannot intervene, a preacher, a woman preacher who goes there twice a week, has great difficulties. They have to come up with solutions just to save the day. She had told me in that cases, uh, in those cases, I talk about this problem to my superiors, but in the end of, at the end of the day, it's me personally who goes to that mosque and who, have to, who has to overcome that problem. So they're trying to do uh, their job and they are trying to find a middle way with these people. As I said in the beginning, in general, imams can announce their sermons. They announce their sermons to their male congregation. They are always in contact with their congregation. So for women being assigned by the presidency does not create this authority right away. And uh, women preachers do not see these, uh, author this authority in themselves. They speak like an ordinary citizen, not like a woman preacher. When they talk about their problem, they uh, talk about those problems as if there is nothing they can do. They don't feel comfortable if been giving sermons in mosques. Because, for example, they can use the main area of the mosque, but if there is a Quran course building next to it, they want to use their room, or if there is a space in the basement, they would like to use that uh, enclosed area, so they do not want to be seen that much. They do not want to draw attention. But not everyone is like that. Some preachers were different. You have two minutes, actually one and a half minutes remaining. Okay. There are some preachers who use their authority to give more place to women. They are those who challenge gender speciality. How? They talk about this issue in their sermons. They say women can go to mosques. They encourage that. They say that they should uh, demand their rights. I listen to more than 40 uh, sermons and this issue comes up a lot when they give sermons. This is something that grabs my attention or they focus on the practice. For example, they use the main area of mosques. They do prayers in the main area. They do not want to go to enclosed areas and they encourage other women, women to do the similar. For example, it's one of the preachers uh, insist on the fact that women should uh, do the Friday prayers in mosques and women say yes we 
do want to do that, but at that time on Friday, uh, there are a lot of men and we do not have time. So they say, what uh, mosque should we go to? They organize and next Friday, they go to the mosque all together and they make uh, the mosque open up a place for, a place for women. So they organize, they come together and they uh, focus on the practice. So they find some cracks, as Zeynep mentioned, as, as uh, Zela mentioned before. They, there are women who find these cracks and who continue their efforts, who find solutions. So under this big umbrella of the presence of religious affairs, they try to keep their existence. Thank you. Thank you very much. And this has been a presentation that sort of complemented the other presentations. And my question is going to be something that has not been answered that has not been answered in the previous presentations either. And I would like to ask you, but maybe you can start and maybe the others could chime in as well. First of all, why did the presidency of religious affairs after 2010 start to work on women's issues as well and started to focus on women as well? And the mosques became a part of this too. We especially see this in the editorials, for example, also when we look at the number of female preachers as well, we see an increase there after 2010. So the woman policies in the presidency of religious affairs has changed systematically after 2010. So I'm talking about the female preachers as well as the other methods as well. You have mentioned their theological origins, uh, some of the theological origins, but I'd like to talk about the political and social reasons of this as well, and I'd like to ask you about that. Thank you very much. Now to the panelists. Um, I'm also going to add some of the questions coming from the audience as well. First of all, Professor Yarar asks all the panelists, in addition to my question, maybe you'd like to answer this again. My question to all panelists or anyone who wants the answer. How can we deepen the concept of equality? So to fix public inequalities, for example, can we talk about positive discrimination or affirmative action? Today, there are those who state that there's sexism in favor of women in the dominant uh, discourse from the opposite of positive discrimination. So, in other words, how is it possible in the field of social um, work to have an understanding of pluralism that goes beyond, you know, listing all these subordinate ident identities one by one? So that question and my question maybe let's say five minutes to answer them. I can give you maybe a little bit uh, more because we kept your presentation a little bit short. So starting with your question, social work, gender, freedom of belief, how can we make social work more solid in that regard? When we talk about social work in Turkey, we always think of the Ministry of Family and Social Services, but in fact, anywhere where people are, there is the professional social work. For example, I'm working as a social work in a public hospital. I work with refugees, asylum seekers, and many other people that have many different beliefs. To make it tangible, I would like to mention one anecdote in the province that I work in, there was an Afghan student and I encountered them because they had attempted suicide and because of a problem that we had in the interpretation, we had a few problems, but then I found out that as 
a university student in a Muslim majority population who is not able to carry out their own religious uh, practices. They told me that they went into depression and because of that attempted suicide. So the differences related to freedom of belief, these appearing in any sort of public forum and what can we do as social work experts about this? What kind of approaches we need to adopt are very important discussions. Also, we live in a certain society as well. We might also espouse some of the principles or beliefs that we have in that society too. But in our profession, we have to be right-based. Therefore, we shouldn't have any prejudices. We shouldn't stigmatize people. We have to accept them as they are. And in that respect, we also provided that kind of service for that person as well. But I think this was a good example. In answer to Professor Yarar's question, we can deepen the concept of equality as such. I believe that we need to include more the opinion of the victims of inequality, share their experiences and enable their participation, participation, have a sort of a mechanism in which the people who are victims of inequality can participate uh, in these processes. Rather than listing all of these identities or like grouping all of these identities, I think in our profession, I would say that we're trying to understand human beings therefore you need to start by understanding first of all the society in which you work and what kind of a dialogue you're going to have with other institutions and in that regard i think having supervisors is very important because some ethnic group for example might have difficulty in terms of understanding how they're going to access services or they could be discriminated against and not even attempt to access services when you have contacts with culture as in the suicide attempt issue that i've just mentioned we might have certain um, challenges in terms of expressing ourselves and because of our profession because it is rights based we have to be um, comprehending the culture in which we live And I believe that there should be training, sufficient training provided for all social workers so that they're going to be more sensitized towards these issues. Professor Yara's other problem is about this as well a little bit, so I'd like to answer that too. So openness in addition to pluralism and transparency and opening up the public sector on principle to everyone i mean the fact that not everybody can access these services for example can benefit from them in the same way i would like to make an observation here especially in the sort of area that i work in sometimes there could be conflicts between theory and practice obviously we need to have the necessary legal basis first of all but If somebody is, for example, benefiting from community health, uh, community psychology services, and there are certain criteria for somebody to benefit from those services, if they are stigmatized by people on the point of getting those services, or for the persons with disabilities, for example, you have a card if you're a person with disability in Turkey, so that you can use buses, for example, free of charge. And the ministry supports that card. However, that means that they have to disclose the information that they are a person of disability, the person with disability. And sometimes when they use this card, when they go on the buses, 
sometimes, for example, there's a beep coming from the bus saying uh, card for person with disability. And sometimes, for example, the people on the bus say that, I mean, you look fine, you don't look disabled, so why are you using that kind of card? So what I want to say in that respect is that in order to prevent exclusion by society of different individuals, then there is a need for training, and this should include the whole society, should be integrated in that manner. I have also seen some individuals that do not want to even access these services, therefore they should be trained in that regard as well. I think they need to have the necessary amount of information to be able to do that. Right, thank you very much. In addition to my question, Betül Yarar has a question for Sheyda Zahra. Can you elaborate on the concept of distance? Have you read the question, by the way? Yes, I have followed all the questions. All right, then, I'm not going to read it once again. Let us just go right into it. And let us also add all the questions that have been asked uh, before. So I am also a veiled bureaucrat at the street level as well, and I am also experiencing what we've told you. I know, for example, that how my identity that I represent is perceived in the houses that I go into and how that could be overcome as well. I don't want people, for example, think that I'm going to be favoring them because of us perceived similarities or that I'm not going to give them enough attention. Therefore, just depending this on culture and identity, I think that would be wrong. And distance for me means that. So distance from the clientelism that my identity could pervade. I think we need to, uh, I need to have that kind of a distance and that distance also ensures a more um, reliable, uh, a more quality service. So that cultural capability makes me go beyond just being a veiled social worker or veiled bureaucrat on the street. And that enables me, as a matter of fact, to go into very different um, areas, environments, and uh, provide my services. And also, I have to answer the pluralism question, I believe. Yes, please go on. I believe there were um, some other questions. Uh, there was a point about cultural uh, capability, and if I could elaborate on that, I'm just going to give you an anecdote, so that's going to be better understood. I believe that you had asked, uh, like, if everybody is going to be there, for example, then is it going to be... Is it going to enable equality? Now, I'm rather asking about this, for example, being from a certain culture, does it also bring on cultural capability as well? No, not really. For example, veiled women in the public sector, just getting them there, does that mean that they're going to have the necessary cultural capability in order to do this profession? Obviously, there are certain people, pious women, for example, who were really happy that there are people in the public employment who are similar to them and they could they thought that uh, those women could understand them better, but some of them were wrong about that, they felt later on. One woman, for example, says, who applied for social assistance and who had a visit in their household. I really liked the person that they sent into my household and he, she was obviously pious and I'd like to see more of her kind in the uh, in the in public employment and we also said we also had some focus groups as well and one of the other uh, women said that the first one was we had a veil on and I was really happy to see her but then she rejected my application for social assistance and why did was it uh, rejected because she was divorced and she had 
applied for a certain social assistance that would generally be provided for divorced uh, 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 people, but the household visitors saw to a pair of men's shoes and thought that they were in fact married and because of that their offer their application was rejected so if they had cultural capability for example if that person had cultural capability they would probably say that having a man there like a cousin or somebody else for example a relative and having their shoes outside the house would give certain security for that household and would make that woman feel safer so they would have known for example if they had that if they had had this natural cultural capability so when we talk about cultural capability we're talking about an intersectional one here a social worker, for example, has to understand why a certain woman is enrolling their children in a in a certain type of school. All right, thank you, Humeira. My question, Mr. Yarar's question, and also there is another. There are two other questions. As a matter of fact, Mine uh, Yildirim has a question as well. So could legal guarantees play a role in combating exclusion, discrimination, and even sometimes aggressive attitudes uh, that women face in mosques? I don't know whether law can help us in that respect. This matter is very idle, doesn't really function very well, in my opinion. And also, as I said, the presidency of religious affairs also supports this and asks for the inclusion of women in the mosques as well. Even the president of the republic, for example, had that kind of a statement as well, so that women could go to mosques. Therefore, the ruling party, uh, the government and the presidency of religious affairs have the same opinion here, are agreed here. However, the sort of the elder men in at certain localities for example they have a very sort of a stubborn opinion that they have uh, developed over the years so i don't really think that that could be done away with through law and there are so many instances of violence against women while, uh, and nothing is being done in terms of the judiciary therefore i don't really think that that could solve the issue and also i'd like to answer your question as well about how the presidency of religious affairs changed their focus towards women so when the religious affairs presidency was first founded the secular state was trying to control religion in a way and especially in the theses that were written during the akp time it is being said that before the presidency of religious affairs was try was just trying to contain religion but then during the akp time it tried to spread the religion uh, we know that there is some truth to that but i don't believe that the presidency of religious affairs completely reneged on its uh, policy or its mandate of controlling religion it's still trying to do that and also spread it i think and obviously, because they see the place of women as very important in the family, that is why they have more women-related activities at the moment. And also, they're trying to design a life where the mosque is at the center. That is why they're paying more attention to this issue at the moment. The presidency believes at the moment that they're talking about the truthful, the rightful religion that is devoid of any misleading information that is based on the quran and the hadith so that is the sort of version of religion that they would like to disseminate they have a lot of problems with the congregations or these sects but they have to come to an agreement at some point with them uh, because they can never overcome them and they have to negotiate and come to an agreement with them although they don't want it but that is the sort of thing uh, that is the sort of approach that they have and that's how they see the mosques especially after the 15th of july coup attempt they were saying for example that you should come to the mosques because if you go somewhere else then you would fall off the cliff cliff 
because they they imply here that there are certain congregations that are not sort of endorsed by the presidency of religious affairs and they could take you places that you don't didn't want to go and we saw this before in during the 15th of july uh, coup as a matter of fact how other people could use uh, religion to mislead people so the presidency of religious affairs believes that the mosque should be the uh, place where they get religious knowledge and information this is also related to children as well right because if the women go into the mosque then the children go into the mosque as well and then they would become pious sooner i think right i believe that this part of issue is a little bit neglected in the presentations i suppose because especially after 2010 when that kind of a policy started to be implemented and maintained later on I think one of the most important points was that the children were going to be part of this religious space and having women there facilitated that. What would you think about that? Yes, I completely agree. We also didn't mention, but the budget of the presidency of religious affairs is also hotly debated. For example, one of the female preachers that I talked to was working in Uskida since the 1990s, but the places that they could go to were restricted because they were only three female preachers working there but at the moment they're trying to increase that number as well the last question you said that the female preachers are sometimes not really listened to uh, in the mosques so, but how, how how does the bureaucratic chain work like do you have for example the imam at the top or the female preacher subordinate to him like how does that work this is in relation to uh, mine's uh, question as well so bourgeois was asked the question about the training of female preachers i believe so the female preachers are more equipped than the imams as a matter of fact because they have to graduate from a four-year theology department and then they have to do their ma they have to get a certain score in the centralized public uh, exam bureaucracy exam uh, ju ju just just a moment uh, uh, the question was not really that so i'm talking about the management mechanism in the mosque so is imam for example the superior and the female preacher is the subordinate yes i mean it's like imam the imam owns the mosque the female preacher just goes there once a week therefore they have to be subordinate to the imam so bureaucratically this like that as well so imam plays a key role there if he wants women preachers to be more active in mosques then uh, he can pave the way for that or he can stop them Zerar Yalçın did not say anything we have one ma last minute remaining if you would like to add anything thank you very much Zehra you asked a question I don't know if that was answered please answer briefly the issue of cultural competence you asked if being part of a culture is related to cultural competence actually the issue of cultural competence lays a foundation for some basic codes and it can act as a nice breaker in terms of establishing relationships in terms of establishing an ownership human relations should exceed the borders of cultural competence it should be those relations should be rights based actually in uh, for any public authority for any public servant it should exceed that it should be based on universal codes and it should be rights based do you have stats do you have statistics what kind of statistics about public representation about public diversification uh, diversification we have statistics about headscarves because that's visible 
but there is no statistics about invisible identities, none about uh, alabism, none about uh, homosexuality. Uh, we do not know anything about the Roma youth, for example. Yes, it's important to have statistics, but it shouldn't be uh, in a way that would stigmatize either. There are certain risks related to it. About representation, about rights to work, this issue forms a basis. And as we said before, it is important in terms of building the social cement. Thank you very much for all the information you've given us. We have two uh, minutes exceeding our time limitation. Thank you very much for your in important contributions. I am very pleased that I have met you. Thank you very much once again. So we are going to close the session now. Will Mine join us and take the floor? Yes, there you are. Thank you very much for this interesting, informative session. Another one. We followed all the sessions very closely. They were all so very interesting. So we have come to the end of this two day conference. We were quite happy to see how many people were interested. Uh, because when we started with the idea of organizing this conference, we weren't sure if we would be able to full, uh, fill a full day, uh, or maybe we would organize it just in a half day. That was the idea. But now we have had a two day conference and there are many more fields that we could discuss. We heard some uh, very comprehensive presentations about freedom of religion, freedom of belief. We have learned so many new things. We have new question marks. I have gotten new ideas personally. I will think about them more in the future. So on behalf of the committee, I would like to thank all of our panelists and moderators. We can see the great effort behind each and every panel. Religion and Human Rights magazines uh, will publish a special edition uh, for the papers and presentations. Also, uh, on our YouTube channel, we are going to publish our uh, conference. We are going to let you know about it. We are going to continue our work on freedom of religion and belief and gender equality in Turkey. This conference has been quite beneficial for us, for our future work. Please keep, uh, please be in contact with us. We would like to hear more about your work and we want to let you know about our work as well. We will be sharing an evaluation form with you at the end of this conference. You are going to receive an email please share your feedback with us. It means the world to us to see your forms. I also would like to thank our interpreters. These two days have been really busy and we had to shorten our uh, breaks. Uh, a great round of applause for their effort. I would like to thank the team of EGAM for the technical organization of this conference. I also would like to thank Zehra Yilmaz and Vlatekin for working with us in the organization of this conference. Our work, our webinars, our reports will continue. Please follow our website to follow our work. And uh, you can also follow our Twitter accounts and YouTube channel. Thank you very much for joining this conference and uh, see you later.